All right, so let's review chapter six, seven, eight, and nine. So these were shorter chapters, but they contain a lot of information. But I'm gonna try and go through them very quick. And um, I put stars on the slides that I want y'all to star. So if I say star this slide, that means it's gonna be on test two. So here we go. All right, so we're gonna talk about energy and enzymes. So energy is the ability to do any type of work or make any type of change. So obviously you have to have some form of energy in order to move, in order to breathe, in order for anything to work. So there is kinetic energy, mechanical energy, potential energy, and chemical energy. So kinetic is, it, it's already moving, it's, it's working, it's doing something. So the example they give is water going over a waterfall. Um, potential energy is stored energy. You can remember that it's stored because you can say it has the potential to do something. And then chemical energy is what you get from the food that we eat. So when you eat something, that's why you're supposed to eat healthy, it gives you energy. So this is the flow of energy through an ecosystem. Um, this is just discussing how the sun gives energy to the plants. The plants grow and give energy to the animals and they grow and get big and put off heat and it's one big cycle. So there are two laws of thermodynamics that you need to know. This is a slide that you need to put a star by. So there's the law of conservation of energy, which means energy cannot be created nor destroyed. So this goes hand in hand with the law of conservation of mass as you matter cannot be created nor destroyed. So same thing. So energy cannot be created or destroyed, but can be changed from one form to another. So I can't make energy, I can't get rid of energy. All I can do is transfer hands. I can move it around. I can shape it into what I want. So this talks about photosynthesizing leaves capture solar energy, and that's something we'll talk about next is we're gonna go through photosynthesis. But the process of photosynthesis is a way for the plants to feed themselves, to give themselves energy. So the plant doesn't eliminate the energy that the sun gives it, it just turns it into carbs and CO2 and water to, so it can give itself nutrients is what that's saying. And lots of energy, most of the energy that goes through an ecosystem, it comes off as heat. So if you go back to this picture, that's just saying all of these things put off heat. So then there's the law of entropy which is when energy is changed from one form to another, there is a loss of energy. So when we're working with the law of conservation of energy, when you say, okay, my energy is changing hands, my energy is going through this system, every time your energy moves or does something or changes, it loses a little bit of itself. So think like you're working out, you're running, and the longer you run, the more tired you get. So it's the same thing when it comes to the law of entropy. So no process requiring a conversion of energy is ever 100% efficient. All that's saying is by the time you get to the end of using that energy, there's not gonna be 100% left because you used it throughout. So then this is an example of thermodynamics through photosynthesis, the sun's coming into the plant, the plant's changing that sun into CO2 and water, it's giving itself nutrients so that it can give the environment nutrients. This is an example of how your body changes energy forms. So these are our muscles. And if you don't know, when you get cold, your body shivers so that your body will try and warm itself up because little bits of energy and little bits of heat are released out of your shivering muscles. So therefore, when you're cold, you shiver because your body's trying to heat itself up. But this is just in a picture explaining that. So you got your carbohydrate that you ate, you know, whatever. Then your uncontracted muscles, because you're fine. Well, then you get cold and your muscles contract and you shiver and you put off heat. And so you warm yourself up, essentially. So cells and entropy, it's the processes occurring in cells are energy transformations. So all of those things that are going on in those organelles, 
those compartments that we talked about last time. They all require some type of energy. So they just move the energy around inside the cell. So every process in these cells increases the total entropy in the universe. Therefore, less energy is available to do useful work. Uh, example was glucose breaks apart into CO2 and water. Um, let's see where it goes with that. Okay. So the takeaway from this slide is these top two lines and then these bottom three. So organisms called producers uh, use energy to create organized structure. So that sentence is discussing the picture with the moose that we looked at. So that goes hunters and gatherers, producers and consumers. They're just changing that energy. Um, like the example of the animal dies in the wilderness and then another animal eats it. Therefore, the energy, the dead animal's technical energy is now transferred into the living animal. That's all that's saying. Uh, let's see what we got next. Okay. All right, so metabolic reactions and energy transformation. So now we're going to talk about how is this energy transferred through. So metabolism is the sum of cellular chemical reactions in a cell. So human metabolism. If you have a high metabolism, your cells can process chemical reactions quicker. You know, you're able to process food quicker. You're able to have a little bit more energy, etc. So there are reactants and products, which if you've taken chemistry, you know that reactants are on the left side of the equation and products are on the right because products are what are produced from the chemical reaction. So the reactants participate in the reaction, the products are the result of that reaction. Uh, free energy is the amount of energy available to perform work. So that's the energy that's just hanging out, waiting to be used. And then you have two types of reactions. So there's exergonic and endergonic. And again, if you've taken chemistry recently, you should have hopefully have heard of these. So in exergonic reactions, your products, the things that were produced, have less free energy than the reactants. So they're just, they're spontaneous. They don't have as much energy left over. They don't have as much energy hanging around. So they're kind of like, you could say, exergonic reaction. The energy is exiting. You know, they don't have as much. And then you have an endergonic reaction where the products, the things that are produced, have more energy than reactants. These are non-spontaneous reactions. So you can remember endergonic with the energy is entering. If, I mean, E and N, entering, ender. You kind of get where I'm going with that. So remember, exergonic reactions, the energy is exiting, there's none left. Endergonic reactions, the energy is entering, so you have a little bit more. All right, and this, actually this slide needs a star on it, and this slide needs a star on it. So ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Energy for cells. So high energy compound used to drive metabolic reactions. ATP is energy. Nothing will happen in your body. Well, not nothing, but most things won't happen in your body without ATP. So ATP is not stored by the cells. The cells don't let it hang out. They use it and get rid of it. So it's constantly being generated from ADP, which is adenosine diphosphate, which means that the DI on that phosphate means there's two phosphates. So it's different than ATP because ATP is adenosine triphosphate and tri means three. So this tells you there's going to be three phosphates and this tells you there's going to be two phosphates. And if you hear that, that is my dog trying to get in the door. Um, so ADP produces ATP. It's a cycle. So remember, ADP produces ATP. So ATP is made of an adenine, going back to those uh, base pairs and the DNA that we talked about. It's composed with a ribose, and then together, adenine and ribose form adenosine, or adenosine, however you want to pronounce it. 
and then there's three phosphates. So that's exactly where I said you should you can you should be able to tell that because it's tri. Tri means three. So energy released by an exergonic reaction is captured in ATP. So remember the energy is exiting. And then ATP is then used to drive an endergonic reaction. So you have an exergonic reaction. This this thing in your body or wherever in the environment just went through a chemical reaction. It put out some energy. So it put out that ATP. And now we have this energy just hanging out ready to be used. So then the ATP is going to be used to do an endergonic reaction. So some of the energy stays inside. So this is just the ATP cycle um, about like where it comes from. So this box, or this box, this little hexagon here, this can be your adenine. And this little box is your ribose. So when these two come together, so remember when there's a line right here that's a single bond? So these two just came together and formed this, which is adenosine or adenosine, however would you like to pronounce it. And then here you can see that these three phosphates are single bonded to this adenosine. So therefore you have ATP, adenosine triphosphate. One, two, three. So just again, this is aden adenine, ribose came together, form adenosine. Adenosine is bonded to one, two, three phosphates. And there is a star beside this as well. So this is just how ATP is produced. You went go through. You start with what we just discussed. Come through ATP adds a phosphate. Um, we kind of skipped all those because I don't think I tested y'all on that cycle. So ATP during muscle contraction. So there are things called myosin and actin filaments that are in your muscles, and when you move any muscle in your body they slide past each other to flex and relax your muscles. But they can't do that alone, they have to have ATP. So here's your myosin filament right here. So myosin assumes it's resting shape when it combines with ATP. So your myosin filament is hanging out, it's chilling. Then it gets some ATP and it says, all right, I'm gonna slide past actin, which is here. And this discusses in ATP splits into ADP those are details. You should really just know actin and myosin are how your muscles move. They slide past each other with the help of ATP. And that's all that's saying. Um, feel free to read the slide, but take away from those last three slides. Actin and myosin slide past each other with the help of ATP, and that is what causes your muscles to move. All right, and so this slide has a star beside it. So metabolic pathways and enzymes. So we know that enzymes are things that kind of help a chemical reaction move along. And these things normally occur in a sequence. Reactions are almost always in a sequence. So products of an early reaction become reactants, AKA substrates of a later reaction. So all that is saying is that whatever you produce randomly over here is probably going to be used to produce something else. So that is where products turning into reactants come from. So these linked reactions are called a metabolic pathway. So it begins with, you know, a particular reactant, one reactant, then it goes through several several intermediates and terminates with a particular end product. So all that is saying is, is it goes through several steps before it gets to the end product that will then be used in a different type of reaction. So in other words, the product of the first reaction is the substrate of the second, and then the substrate of the second, and so on and so on and so on, except in the case of here, because G was your end product. So this is a pretty decent example. So A is your initial reactant or substrate, substrate, so here you go, here's your reactant. That line signals a chemical reaction. Say B was your product. Well, now this product turns into a reactant, AKA a substrate. Then we got all these other steps. And when you have these multiple steps in this pathway, they're called intermediates. And then when you finally reach the end of that metabolic pathway, 
then you have your end product, which is represented here by G. All right, this slide has a star by it as well. So then we get into enzymes. So enzymes are protein molecules that function as catalysts. So if you hear the word enzyme and catalyst, sometimes they go hand in hand, at least on the chemistry aspect of things, not so much in the biology always. So a catalyst is what pushes a chemical reaction along. It catalyzes it. So the reactions of an enzymatically catalyzed reaction are called substrates. So again, same thing we were just talking about. This reactant is also known as a substrate, right? So each enzyme accelerates that specific reaction. Each enzyme gets it going. So the end product will not be formed unless all of the enzymes in the pathway are present and functional. So this is the same picture we just looked at. So here is your reactant or your substrate. Here's your chemical reaction. But here you see that your chemical reaction is only happening because of this enzyme. Same for all the other ones. These chemical reactions are only going and going because of these enzymes. These enzymes are catalyzing these reactions in this metabolic pathway. So the active site of an enzyme complex complexes with the substrate. It causes the active, active site to change shape. So that's going back to that lock and key type of movement like we talked about with the sodium potassium pumps. So the shape chain change forces substrates together, initiating bond formation. So induced fit model, the definition of that is the enzyme is induced to undergo a slight alteration to achieve optimum fit. All that means is that the active site is going to change itself so much to the point that that enzyme fits perfectly so that the chemical reaction can continue to take place. And there is a star on this slide as well. And this slide as well. So there are two other types of reactions. We've got degradation and synthesis. So a degradation reaction is a breakdown reaction. It's going to break some things apart. It's going to degrade them. And then a synthesis reaction is going to put some things together. It's going to synthesize some things. I need to let my dog in one sec. So degradation is enzyme complexes with a single substrate. Substrate is broken apart into two products. So again, degradation, we're breaking things apart, we're degrading them. And then a synthesis, the substrates are joined together and released as a single product. So they synthesize, they join together. Skip. In the slides that I'm skipping, y'all can mark out because I didn't test y'all on those. So factors that affect enzymatic rate. So you have substrate concentration, and there's a star by this slide. So what that means is enzyme activity increases with substrate concentration due to more frequent collisions between substrate molecules and the enzyme. So that means the more substrate you got, the more enzyme activity you got, because there's more of each to collide with each other to produce a reaction. So then you have optimal pH. So that could be the pH in your body. And normal pH for the humans is 7.35 7.45. Most enzymes are optimized for a particular pH. So they gave an example in the case of pepsin or trypsin. So pepsin is what is in your stomach um, that helps synthesize proteins that you eat and trypsin as well um so you remember pepsin protein p and p and then so optimum protein digestion takes place at their respective ph so if the ph of your stomach gets all wacky pepsin and trypsin are not gonna work so temperature also affects enzymatic rate so enzyme activity increases with temperature so the hotter it gets the more enzyme activity you'll have. There'll be more collisions because they're hot. They're all running around. They're freaking out, right? Warmer temperatures cause more efficient, effective excuse me, collisions between enzymes and the substrate. However, hot temperatures can denature these enzymes as well. And with denature means that it can break them apart. It can cause them to not work. 
So if it gets too hot, these enzymes are gonna say, nope, we're gonna denature, we're not gonna work, we're gonna break apart. Which makes sense because if it's too hot outside, does anybody wanna go outside and do any work? Let's see. All right, there's a star on this one as well for these definitions. So cells can regulate the presence or absence of an enzyme. Cells can regulate the concentration of an enzyme. So what that means is cells can say, yep, we want this enzyme. No, we don't want it. They can say, yes, we want this much of it, or no, we want this little bit of it. And cells can activate or deactivate some enzymes. So then they can, cells can also say, yeah, we're gonna allow you to work, or no, we don't want you to work. So then there's enzyme cofactors, which are molecules required to activate an enzyme. So these are the things that need to be present for the enzyme to work. So something called FAD, and NAD plus and NADP plus. These are called cofactors. And you will see these when we go through the Calvin cycle and all that in the next few chapters. And then there's coenzymes. They are non-protein organic molecules. Coenzymes are things like vitamins. So. So I was debating on if I wanted y'all to know this, but there's not a star, so we're not going to worry about it. Keep on moving. All right, so oxidation reduction reactions in metabolism. So redox reactions. So before we get into this, you need to be ready to flip how you're thinking because redox reactions are opposite than what you would think they would be. So these types of reactions, electrons pass from one molecule to another. So then there's something called oxidation or where you oxidize, it's where you lose an electron. And then there's a reduction, which is where you gain an electron. So that's where I'm coming from when I say that you have to think oppositely. So oxidation, you lose reduction you gain and they take place at the same time so they're called redox reactions so one molecule or atom accepts the electron given up by the other so the example is in the production of sodium chloride NaCl or table salt sodium is oxidized and chlorine is reduced so what that means is sodium loses an electron and chlorine gains one so a real good trick to remember redox reactions is the term oil rig. Oxidation is lost, reduction is gained. So oil rig. So granted, since you're in a bio 101 class, I'm not gonna go too in depth because redox reactions are very heavy in chemistry courses. But the takeaway from here is to know that there are lots of oxidation reductions reactions that go on in the environment and in your body but i would know if i were to say okay in this reaction we are working with a redox type of reaction tell me what is happening when this reaction oxidizes or reduces and i would just want you to be able to say you know oil rig oxidation is lost reduction is gained so then we've got photosynthesis and cellular respiration there's a star beside this because I would like it if y'all could know these reactions right here. Because these are very important as you keep going on in more biologies if you have that desire. Because um, these are probably two of the most common reactions in the environment. So we've got the photosynthesis reaction and cellular respiration. So that's how our cells breathe and do everything. So in photosynthesis... You've got C6O2, so six carbon dioxides, react with six wa waters, react with energy to produce glucose and to produce oxygen. So these are redox reactions. Then there's cellular respiration, which is where you take this glucose and this oxygen 
and you react together to form carbon dioxide, water, and energy. So pay close attention that these are the exact same components, but they're flipped. So photosynthesis, you take CO2, water, and energy, and you put out glucose and oxygen, right? So you're giving that out so your cells can use it. Well, your cells take this, this product. So this goes back into where we discussed products turn into reactants, a.k.a. substrates, to be used in another reaction. So you've got glucose and oxygen here. So our cellular respiration takes that glucose and oxygen and says, all right, let's, you know, break these apart and put back out CO2, water, and energy. And so that is chapter six. And I'll do another video for chapter seven.